But welcome to Refuge Assembly. It's going to be a great day in Jesus. A lot of wonderful things going on in the spirit. A lot of wonderful things going on around the world. Um, although it seems like the darkness is getting darker, when that happens, the light inside of us, Jesus, will shine brighter and brighter. This was prophesied in the book of Daniel. Yes. This is in Matthew 5.16. And it's just the way it is. And I'm just glad, I'm just glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning. How many feel, people feel like for revival for a while the past couple of Wednesdays no about the past month of Wednesdays the services have been going through the roof three or four Wednesdays ago uh, we had a service uh, Dee brought in a healing rooms team friend of hers from Knoxville and they came join us on a Wednesday the, the next day Randy and I we had a meeting with the uh, big folks from the district in Hendersonville, we had a meeting uh, the next day and they were asking us, how was Wednesday night service? We looked at them and we said, five hours long. They said, did you say five? I said, five hours long, we had church. And nobody let, nobody wanted to leave because there was Prophetic, miracles, signs, wonders, all kind of things going. So they got interested. In, what, what are you guys doing? I said, well, we're just following Holy Spirit. He's doing the work. So we're just following instructions. So they were like, so then the next Wednesday, something else go And we stayed. It was great. Last Wednesday, the same thing. All the time we have spent teaching about revival... And then the Lord, of course, gave us that word. Uh, I'll tell you that word in a minute. What, what he gave this church, a word for us and for others. And we'll go over that in a minute. But matter of fact, no, I'm supposed to say it right now. And when I was seeking the Lord about the word he gave the church a couple of weeks ago. And everybody say, what word? What word? Oh, I'm glad you asked. The word was, I like what you've been talking about, revival. That was a word from the Lord for this church. I like what you've been talking about, revival. I was seated praying about this, and I felt him say right after that, let me teach you what is needed for real revival and the ingredients that is required for real lasting revival. And I said immediately, yes, Lord, where shall I turn to in the word? And I distinctly heard, just keep reading in Nehemiah. Because last week we spoke on Nehemiah 8 about the joy of the Lord. Let's look at that for just a minute. Let's pray first. Father, we know you're already here. You inhabit the praises of your people. Lord Jesus, thank you for honoring us with your presence you said if two or three are gathered together in my name, you'd be in our midst. You're here. Holy Spirit, you reside in each one of us. And when we get in one accord, which we're doing, which we've been doing, praising you, there's something's been going on here already in the spirit all morning. So it's like it's, I'm not going to say it's building to a frenzy because a frenzy, a frenzy would mean we're going crazy and we're not quite <laughs> going crazy yet, but it's building to a point that the best word for it is a great awakening, revival. This has been prophesied that this would be happening in this time we live in, in the prophecies. Some of them came in the Welsh revival in 1904. Other ones came as Azusa Street in 1906. They said in about 100 years or so, there's going to be a great worldwide revival. 
other people have tapped into the same uh, prophecy. Uh, they received prophetic words. Some of them talked about the revival will start in the southeast United States, but it won't be just in one place. It'll be little fires all over. It's building. Sid Roth has had guests on his show saying the same thing. It's building. Somebody say it's building. So with what's been going on here, and then the Lord gave us the word, I like what you've been talking about, revival. And he said, let me teach you what is needed for real revival and the ingredients that's required. Zach, will you pass out those right there? These are the handouts. Marcus, you can take one side of the church. And Thank you so much. I appreciate you guys so much. So last week's message was... The joy of the Lord is your strength. Can we say that together? The joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, you know, we use that and we say that scripture often, but we felt led to go behind it and find out why that was said. So I'm just going to reiterate that for just a minute and then we'll go into today's message. Last Sunday, we talked about Nehemiah 8 concerning the joy of the Lord is your strength. And what happens was, what happened was when the people heard the word of God, understood it and started to mourn, they were told not to mourn by the Levites and the priests, but remember that the joy of the Lord is your strength. What happened was they heard the word of God and they realized when they heard the words out of the book of the law that, oops, we blew it. Our forefathers have blew it for a few generations. That's why we're in the mess we are. Let me fast forward to where we are in the world, in the United States in particular right now. Since the early 60s, they started taking God out of the schools. They started taking God out of the government. Everything from no more Bibles in the school, no more prayer in school time, no more uh, Ten Commandments uh, by the judicial courts or in front of the libraries. Or they started taking God out. And I know the Lord was probably saying, all right, you want to do things on your own? Haven't you read your history? And the Bible, the Bible has four different parts in it. History, prophecy, poetry, and biography. There's all four things in there. But the history part, like in Nehemiah, these people were in a fix. The people of Israel had forgotten the Lord, forgotten his word, started doing their own thing. There are certain things that doing your own thing is a good thing because the Lord does not make robots. He made us all individuals. There are certain things he wants us to be ourselves we he don't want us to be cookie cutters of anybody else and the lord will give you the power to be the best you you could be for his glory i was supposed to say that this morning i'm gonna say it again matter of fact touch somebody and say the lord's going to give you the power to be the best you you can possibly be for his glory hallelujah what happened was the people heard the word of God and they started to mourn. They started to cry because they said, ah, we blew it. That's why we're in the mess. We did not only us, but our forefathers, our governments. Uh, we just, so their the whole group of people came back from Babylon because they were in exile 70 years. They came back to Jerusalem. The walls were broken down. The temple was burned with fire. It was just a mess. But Nehemiah was in this last part of getting the walls rebuilt. And now, now remember, Nehemiah, he was the cupbearer to the king in Babylon. So the Lord put him in this position. Some we say he gave him favor. And he said to the king of Babylon, he says, man, I know some of my people have already gone back to Jerusalem to fix things up, but I really feel I'm supposed to be there too. And, he, and the king said, okay, go with my blessing and go do what you feel the Lord would have you to do. 
See, Nehemiah, he probably went, hey, whoopee, I'm going back home. Did you ever feel, did you ever been out for a while from your home? And it's like, I'm going home. I love it. There's a good feeling about that. He said, I'm going home. All of a sudden, he comes into Jerusalem, and I mean, he got a mess. He said, okay, time to clean up. But God was directing his steps. And he had a buddy there, Ezra, the priest and scribe. So the two of them. So one's a priest and a scribe, and he's in the position of governor and cleanup crew. Matter of fact, they put Nehemiah in the position of the contractor to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and the temple. So you've got a contractor and you've got a, a priest, and they're working together like this. Anybody that's speaking to already? Because... We needed, they needed both back then. They needed not only the priest, but they needed the, the uh, contractor also to figure how the job was going to get done. Obviously, the Lord directed their steps, united them together. Ezra was feeding the people spiritually, and uh, Nehemiah was getting the contractor work done, rebuilding the walls. 52 days it took them to rebuild Jerusalem. It was a miracle. Because in reality, um, people were saying that it'll take years to rebuild it. 52 days. Anybody have a challenge before them right now? You're not sure how you're going to get it done? Who is, who's, who's got a challenge? Everybody? If the Lord did it for Nehemiah and his people in 52 days, let me step out into the prophetic and say, why not for you? If he can do it for them, why not for you? I'm supposed to say that this morning. Don't continue to look at your challenge in the natural. You've got to look at it through the eyes of faith. I can do, help me out, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Don't just say it once. Live it. Wake up tomorrow morning. Face the challenge. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The Lord said, he'll never leave me or forsake me. Lord, with your help, I know we can move forward and take care of this. I don't know who this is for. You know what? I'm going to grab a piece of that for myself because we're, we're renovating a bathroom. And you know how much I love plumbing. <laughs> never mind. That's all I'm going to say about that. I'm going to grab some of that. Is that okay with everybody? Anybody else want to grab it? You go grab it, pull it down, put it in your car. We'll check out by the end of service, okay? So let's go on. Back to Nehemiah uh, chapter 8. This was last week's, but it's important to go over last week's just for a minute before we get into the new stuff. So they read in the book of the law. The people uh, started to cry. They realized they had done wrong. That's why they were in the position they were. That's why Jerusalem was all broken down. And the Levites and priests and Ezra said to them, listen, folks, okay, you cried. You repented. That's good. Now step out of that, move forward, because the joy of the Lord is your strength. The mourning and the crying leads to repentance. We blew it, okay? Now you... Get out of that. You say, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Folks, we've got work to do. There is a world out there dying and needing answers. Remember Radio Shack used to have this commercial? You've got questions, we got answers. I'm going to adapt that. You've got questions, refuge, assembly, we got answers. And our answer is very simply, Jesus. We may not be able to fix your problem, but we know who can. And if it takes us to walk beside you a little ways till you get on your feet, that's our job. Okay? We walk beside you, and everybody here has a part to play. We heard a testimony of somebody talking about this morning of, and Gina, well, you can, if you don't mind, we'll say that testimony shortly, of somebody that needed not a hand out, a hand up get to level ground and that only comes through a godly person that the Lord would use to be able to lead somebody lead somebody to the Lord 
Amen? Amen. Let's go on. So all of a sudden the people said, no, no, no more crying, the priest said. And the people said, all right, all right. The joy of the Lord is your strength. See, Nehemiah was giving him a, pet, a pep talk too. The joy of the Lord is your strength. You're going to need that because somebody say, pick up the hammer. Because they had work to do. We've got work to do. And we can do it. Tap your neighbor and say, we can do this. Now, that was last week's. Okay. He said to them, the priest said to them, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, send, send to go cups, uh, to, to go plates, portions unto them to whom nothing is prepared. Not everybody showed up for the meeting that day. Okay. So, say, listen, go home, get with the rest of your family over there. They didn't show up to the meeting, but send them some food as you're preparing it and tell them what God did and why the joy of the Lord is your strength. Here we go. Now today's message. The title of it is in the ingredients for real lasting revival. Lord gave me this last week and I had no idea of what he was going to lead me into it, but I walked into it by faith. Uh, Zach and Marcus just handed out some papers over there. You'll be able to take those with you and pray about these things, but we'll go over these things this morning. Okay? So I'm reading from Nehemiah chapter 9, just verses 1 through 3. I'm reading out of the King James Version. So if you have in your Bibles and you have a different version, it doesn't make any difference. It's all good. Now, on the 20 and fourth day of the month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting, sackcloth, and earth upon them. This was uh, in those days when you were in deep trouble and you were repenting, they wanted to take it all the way. So they would not wear their regular clothes. They would put on, and there's a picture of this coming out, they would put on sackcloth. It just, anybody ever see like a potato sack or an apple? They would put that... Up oh, there it is, right there. They they dress like that, and that's how they would pray. They dress in sackcloth. They'd even take some of the ashes from a fire, throw it on top of their head. They were humbling themselves in the sight of the Lord. And if my people, who are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Do we need that right now? Yes. Well, that's where we are. We need that. They needed it then. We need it now. We need this now. Somebody say, if my people. That's what we got to do. They, they humble themselves before the Lord. Verse 2, the seed of Israel separated themselves from the strangers and stood. They confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. Verse 3, and they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord their God. What fourth part of the day, like a, a quarter of the day, just like we did that other Wednesday night. Another fourth they confessed and they worshiped the Lord their God. Verses 1, 2, and 3. In that little handout I gave you. That's a whole bunch of that right there. In just verses 1, 2, and 3. As the Lord is showing me this stuff. Because, hey listen, this is bigger than me. Okay? He showed me this. I didn't figure this out myself. He showed me this. I'm just passing on what he showed me. I'm going to give the glory where it's due. It's, I'm just the messenger he wrote this. He put this together. So let me read a little more, okay? And you could be kind of glancing at that paper because some of these things, this is what the Lord gave us for the ingredients for real lasting revival. So uh, let me have that, get that paper. So they fat, they, wrong paper. Hold on. So on that piece of paper, the first thing uh, we see in that ingredients for a lasting revival, they heard the word, understood it, and start applying it. Somebody say, that's a good thing. They heard the word. They understood it and started applying it. We read that in verse 1. In matter of fact, we read that from the last week's message. They heard the word, repented. They said, the joy of the Lord is your strength. They started applying it by building the walls. The second thing is they humbled themselves, repented, 
started praying for revival. They wanted revival for the whole nation. That's what we need right now. Not, and if it starts here and, and just carries on around the world, that's fine. They humbled us to repent. Uh, number three, they separated themselves from any bad influence. Let me just park here for one second. I want to say this in a nice way. Uh, in verse 2 uh, from Nehemiah, it says, they separated themselves from strangers. I said, Lord, how do you want me to say that? Well, they separated themselves from bad influence because some of the people that were among the Israelis, uh, the Jewish people back then, they had no idea about the laws, about the word of God, who God was, what they did. So... They brought in their theories to compare them against what God was doing. Let me say it another way. How many people have ever been around people that were not good influence on your life? If you hang around them long enough, it will rub off. So when they separated themselves from these strangers... They had to get away from the bad influence. Amen? I'm not even going to go into stories. But being in the music business for many years, I had to really watch myself. Because there was a lot of bad influence. Even when we were on the ships together. But if you seek the Lord every day, and you ask him to lead and guide you according to his perfect will. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. We've been saved. See, he's called us out of the world, but we still live here. But after a while, you get to be an overcomer. And then you could go into the world with the idea of I have to see these people. I'm going to see them with a different attitude. I want them saved. It's, it's actually a missionary journey. And that's what the Lord did with us on the cruise ships for many years. But the bad influence, he won't let you continue among people of bad influence until you become an overcomer. When you become an overcomer, then he'll allow you to go back in, reach in, pull them out of the fire. We'll be talking, well, Gene will be talking about that in a few minutes. Let's look at number four. They confessed their iniquities and those of their ancestors. Thus, help me out. This is a very important thing. They break in generational curses. We do deliverance at this church. For those online, we, do, we have a deliverance ministry at this church. Generational curses, I don't care who told you what, they are real. It is in the Bible. The sins of the fathers goes down through many generations until it's broken. When they were confessing their iniquities and those of their ancestors, they started repenting for their sins and the sins of their ancestors. This is a very big part of breaking generational curses. Let's go on number five. They worshiped the Lord with all their hearts. Did we do that this morning or not? We, it was good too. Number six, they started talking about all the things the Lord had done for them. Their testimonies, because we're overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Number seven, they made a fresh commitment to the Lord to serve him, and they sealed it. We'll be doing that later. Now let's go back into the message. So what happened was they went through this, this verse one through three. They did most of this stuff. And then in verse four, okay? And I'm just going to paraphrase. Then stood up on the stairs the Levites. I'm not going to try to pronounce these next names. They cried out with a loud voice to the Lord their God. They said to everybody, stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. They blessed and, uh, and blessed be the, thy glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. You know what? Let's do that. Can everybody stand up? And just in your own way, whatever you want to do, just shout, Blessed be the Lord. Be the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed be thy glorious name. Be thy glorious name. 
Be exalted above all blessing and praise. Oh, we've got to do this a couple more minutes. Above all blessing and praise. Hallelujah. Blessed be thy holy name. Blessing and glory and honor and power and dominion and might to thy holy and wonderful name forever and ever. I don't know if you guys are feeling what I'm feeling. I'm, it's like high power electricity going around. Forever and ever. Blessed be thy holy name. You can be seated if you can. Woo, yeah. Somebody tap your neighbor and say, we're doing it. We're, we're doing it. We're doing it. Thou even, thou, o Lord God, you have made the heaven, the heavens of heaven. The, the priests have started saying this. Everybody's agreeing with them. Well, you made all their host, God, all the earth, all things. That, you made the seas and everything that's in the seas. You preserves them all, and the host of heaven worships you. They worshiped the Lord. That's one of those steps. Uh, I don't know what, what number that is. Somebody tell me what number that is on that paper. They worship the Lord. Step five. Then they did this. We're going to have fun with this. Let me get a couple of microphones handy over here. Then they spoke of what the Lord did. Here's the white microphone. Now we'll try one. If we need two, we'll get the second one. Jimmy has the white microphone. One, two, three. Is that? Yeah. They spoke of the testimonies of what the Lord had done for them. Let me tell you about something that was done in the Old Testament. Whenever God showed up and did an incredible miracle, they would either set up a great big stone, they called it an Ebenezer stone, or a big pile of stones. That way, whenever they were walking by that way, and the kids would ask, what's this big stone or this big pile of stones? What's that for? They said, that's when the Lord showed up right in this spot and defeated the armies before us. Or he did this miracle or that miracle. They set up a monument, a stone, a bunch of stones. And Hey, listen, in, in Israel, in the Mideast, there's a lot of stones, okay? So they had to make it, they had to make sure it stood out. And that's prophetic. They had to make sure that what the Lord did stand, stood out enough where people would ask questions. If we're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people set apart, you know that many times we already stand out wherever we go. And that's okay. As long as you stand out in a way that is good. Now, some people stand out in ways that are not so good. But this is a different thing. We're like an Ebenezer stone. Our lives. But they started speaking of the testimonies of what the Lord had done for them. Lord, you're a God who chose Abraham. You brought him out of the Ur of the Chaldees. You gave him the name of Abraham instead of Abram. You found his heart faithful. You saw the affliction in Egypt. You heard our cry by the Red Sea and you showed all kind of signs and wonders. How many people saw the movie The Ten Commandments? Okay, I'm going to read the, the gospel according to Dennis. Well, the Lord got angry and he went in there and he kicked butt. Okay, let's just say he, he showed out. This is the way we do it in the South. He showed out. Aren't you glad he did? Aren't you glad he's still showing out? He's going to show out some more today. You know that, right? Hallelujah. He showed these signs to Pharaoh, all his servants, and all the people of the land, even the, the, the priests of the Pharaoh, they were different religion. They said, Pharaoh, we known troubled times in war, but nothing like this. This is this God of, uh, of the Jews, this God of Abraham. Isaac. We, can't, we can't do these things. They were magicians. They, everything was deceitful. Everything was uh, cheap imitations and that's what the devil does sometimes matter of fact pretty much all the time he has cheap imitations of what godly things are the gifts of the spirit we have the word of knowledge word of wisdom prophecy and he has his what they call psychics okay different door different method different 
different whole thing. Dennis, how do you know that? Because I've done enough studying over the years, and I was involved in the occult years ago before it was even used the name occult. It was New Age. It was even before that. Dennis, you sound old. Hey, listen. When I was born, the Dead Sea was just sick. I'm just saying. Let's just stop there. In any case. But they were talking about the testimonies of God. What he did. And instead of me going out and continue reading the testimonies, we have some testimonies in the house because God is still doing miracles. We were talking about, the one we were just talking about right now was, was how the Lord, when, he, when you become an overcomer, he'll set you, when he's confident in you, when you're confident in him, he will send you back in to a place where you've been that would have been dangerous to you years ago, but because you've been an overcomer. Now you're going in like a missionary trip. Gina, could you talk a little bit about what you told us in the prayer room this morning, what the Lord did this past couple of days? So, and just face the camera right over there. Um, I was just sharing this morning um, that I had an opportunity yesterday. Um, I had to go to a baby shower, and, and so on my way I picked Jasmine up. And I don't even live in this town anymore. It's the town that I lived in when I was a, a, addicted to pain pills for 12 years. Um, and just when I lived there, everywhere that I turned, drugs were there. And I knew that. And it was just easily, like, accessible. And um, so testimony in that is that God pulled me out of there. Um, he set me free, delivered me from drugs. He's healed me. Um, we moved to Dayton. He, he placed us in Dayton. And so we just got out of that area. And um, so I was on my way to pick Jasmine up in Decatur. And... Um, the Lord told me uh, there, there was um, a family over there that um, literally is in the darkness that I was in and um, used to go to their house all the time and, and we come to love them as people. Um, and so the Lord told me on the way over there, he said, I want you to stop by there after you pick Jasmine up and I want you to release the life of God over them. And... Um, he told me specifically to, to, to you know, to, to mention to them that they needed to repent. There needed to be repentance and forgiveness. And so um, I went and picked Jasmine up, and um, I stopped by um, over there when I, because she doesn't live far from them. And um, so I had found out that he has, had, he has cancer, and he's had cancer for a little over three years, and didn't tell anybody. Like his his wife knew. Um, but they didn't share that with a lot of people. And it wasn't until recently that people started finding out that they, that he has cancer. And so what I, it was just so sad because when I pulled up on the property, as soon as I got out, I could just, I felt the spirit of death there. And, um, when I looked at him and his wife, they just didn't look well. And, um, it broke my heart. <laughs> Because somebody that was in that darkness knows what it feels like. You know the desperation and you don't have any hope. But I'm so grateful for the opportunity. I'm grateful that I'm an overcomer and that God was able to send me back into that darkness to bring his marvelous light onto their property. Because when I went over there and I began to pray for them because he just he allowed me the liberty to do what God told me to do. And, and he was very receptive, him and his wife both. They just wept. I mean, they just, they wept. And um, I prayed over them and I told them about the forgiveness thing that God told me to tell them repentance and forgiveness. And they just sobbed the entire time. The whole time I was there, I was there for an hour. And the, the, the husband, um, the one with cancer, just, he cried the entire time. And I was just so grateful for that because that just showed me that they were open and God was moving and I was just able to go over there and pray over them and release the life and the light of God in, in them and on their property. And um, he was just thanking me over and over. And I, I left there and I was like, God, you are so good. 
because they weren't alone. There was, there was a couple gentlemen there that I know um, from my past, uh, what they were into, and they heard the testimony that I shared with the gentleman and his wife and what God had done. And so um, I was just so grateful and just wrecked by the presence of God because I know I know that he told me to go and I know that when I was so that I know that when I went there I was I was bringing light and life to a dead place. I knew that I was a carrier of his presence and his light and his glory and I I'm just so grateful that I'm positioned like that. I'm grateful that I'm in a position that God can say, hey, I need you to go do this. Spread my kingdom. Isn't that what it's about? Love my people. And so I praise God for his goodness, for his faithfulness, his mercy, his grace, um, just for being my source, my everything, my strength. And then I'm able to go, and he tells me to and leads me. I'm able to go and release that to people that are broken and hurting and dying and desperate, and they have no hope. So I praise God. Hallelujah. Somebody say, thank you, Lord Jesus. See, when you, when you become an overcomer, the thing that could have taken her out years ago made her and almost did made her an overcomer. Did you ever hear the expression, what doesn't kill you will make you stronger? Yes. Well, when Jesus is in it, that's what happens. She became an overcomer. She brought salvation to people yesterday. Hallelujah. Now, I'm not saying you're going to set up a big pile of stones in their front yard. I'm just saying. <laughs> but in here, there's an Ebenezer stone today because of that. D, do you have a testimony of what the Lord has been doing? Because I could talk about some of the testimonies that they talked about, but for the benefit of all everybody here and for those online, God is still doing this. Yes. No, the miracles did not stop with the apostles and disciples back there. It didn't stop. People lost faith. But he's still doing it. I, I, I mean big time. D. And that's what this church is all about. Praise God. And I was privileged to sit in on your deliverance that day, Gina. Pastor and Bobby and I. And it's a beautiful thing that has happened in her life. And we just praise the Lord for you and your family. And, you know, I was looking for a church. And um, didn't know where to begin because I had just moved to this area. And the Lord put it in my heart to just come here. And so um, I didn't know. My husband had pastored in the assembly years ago. And so I came in and was made to feel so welcome here. This is a beautiful body of Christ here. And um, I was made to feel so welcome. And as I sat in the pew, the Lord that morning had, well, the week before, the Lord had told me the word community. And I thought, okay, I guess you want me to come to my community, Lord, because I was driving back and forth 60 miles to a church that I had uh, attended, and my husband and I had been instrumental in uh, organizing. And it was hard to leave the, that body, but I knew when I heard his voice, community, what he was telling me. So I came that morning, and I was, as I was sitting here, I looked. And here was a book that I thought was a songbook. But when I took it out, it said, Saudi Community Chapel. I said, okay, Lord, I know you're talking to me here. <laughs> so after Pastor finished, well, I don't even think you had finished your sermon. I think you were just ministering. And he walked down the aisle and stood there. And he said, may I give you a word? And he told me everything that was concerning me. And then he said, the Lord has more for you. There's going to be more for you. And you know what? I'm living out that more today. My heart was for healing rooms. And Pastor, when he found out, he set up a healing rooms here so that we pray for the sick here. We pray during every service for the sick. 
And then we, were, we knew that we needed more, and there was the deliverance ministry. So we've had deliverance ministry in this church. Gina is an example, and there are others here in this congregation. So if there are needs in your heart, we just invite you to come. There's answers here. Pastor preaches the word, and there's evidence of his goodness in all of these people, all of these people. So we just praise the Lord for a place where we can come and gather as a family of God. And this is a true family of God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Dee. That was beautiful. And isn't this exciting? <laughs> Miracles. And we love you being here, Jasmine. Jasmine just said, I love this church. <laughs> so let me read you a few more testimonies back then and We'll have some more testimonies from in-house. Sound good? Thank you. So God did all these signs for Pharaoh. Remind me that I put the microphone there so I'm not searching all over the place for it. Just remind me. So, Pharaoh, uh, so God did all these signs in front of Pharaoh and all his servants, and he divided the Red Sea before them. Now, that was cool. I mean, just took the Red Sea and opened it up. Dennis, did that really happen? Yes. And the Pharaoh and his chariots followed behind. There is a, uh, uh, what's the name? a Christian archaeologist. He passed away a few years ago, but he was actually from Tennessee. Uh, Ron Wyatt. And he and uh, his sons and his wife, wonderful ministry. Just, But he was over there. And uh, they scuba dived underwater. Uh, where, they th where they thought the crossing might have been because there was a pillar on each side that was erected. Did somebody say an Ebenezer stone? And as they were scuba diving underneath, they saw the remain of chariot wheels in the water. I mean to tell you, that was so exciting to see that. We'll talk more about that. But yes, it really happened. Charles Heston wasn't, wasn't there at, th at the time, but he led the people of, he led the Jewish people through this. The, the, a cloud by day, could you imagine a pillar of a cloud? Not this way, we see that all the time. This way, from the ground up. The only other time I've ever heard of a pillar or a cloud or a pillar of fire was at Azusa Street, 1906. Does he still do these things? Yep. Are we expecting him to do it here? You can if you want to. We are expecting it. Thank you, Jana. I'll take, I'll take that. He led these people by a cloudy pillar by day and fire by night. They came down from, he came down from uh, Mount Sinai. He made known to them his holy Sabbath. He, the Lord commanded his precepts, statutes, laws by the hand of Moses. He gave them manna, bread from heaven, for their hunger, brought forth water out of the rock for their thirst. He promised them that they would go and possess the land which the Lord had sworn to give them. Did they do it? Yep. Did they mess up along the way? Yep. Huh? Yeah. And that's where we are. I mean, we say God bless the USA. But we've got to get back on course with God. They tried taking Bibles out of the school. They tried taking prayer out of the school. And they succeeded. I can go on with a list of what they. Dennis, who are they? People influenced by the enemy. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, power, spiritual wickedness in high places. And the spiritual, the spiritual wickedness in high places, they, that directs the step of ungodly people. And they've made a little bit too much progress for me. Anybody in agreement with me? Somebody say, we're going to take it back. We're going to take back the land. Online. We're going to take it back. We're going to take back this land. We're going to do it. And it's going to get done in revival. 
because as we're reading, God done it, this kind of revival before. When the people sinned and they turned away from God, he let things happen to them. Are things happening bad to us right now in this land? Yes. It's time for revival. We won't take it back. We're going to take back this land for God. Dennis, is it possible? He did it before. And the things that we wrote on that paper, the seven things we need to do. Why not again? Somebody say, do it again, Lord. We're ripe for revival. Can God really do miracles again? Would you like to hear another testimony? Randy and Linda? What's what's he been doing? To tell us what it just face right into the camera there, Linda. And what's God been doing in your lives? Well, the thing that came to mind first was we were attending just a few short months. My daughter needed new eyeglasses, and so she went to a local optometrist at, a, at an eyeglass place and had, our, had her eyes checked, and the optometrist found a, some kind of spot in her eye that looked dangerous to them and said, I'm, I'm making an appointment for you with an ophthalmologist. This is serious. It looks bad, and I don't want you to waste any time getting to the ophthalmologist to look at it. And so it, a week later, her, her appointment was scheduled for. In the meantime, it was a Sunday morning, and so we gathered around her and prayed and laid hands on her as a congregation for her healing. And then she went to the ophthalmologist in Cookville, and they looked at her eye, and they said, I, I don't know what you're talking about. There's no spot on this eye whatsoever. <laughs> and of course, they probably attributed to, you know, the optometrist didn't know what they were doing, I guess. I don't know, but I know that spot was there. There was proof of it being there, and God healed it. Amen. Let me say thank you, Lord Jesus. <clears throat> thank you, Lord Jesus. You know, m may I just add to that a little bit? And uh, Linda, when you were here, and uh, uh, this was when that first took place, you said you were having trouble with your eyes too. And we prayed over your eyes. Go ahead, Linda. Well, what happened is I'd, I had watched a Todd White video on Saturday night about um, the Lord healing through Todd White a 10-year-old boy's eyesight. He was uh, legally blind and without... Years ago, I was considered legally blind, but then I had eye surgery, and so I still needed glasses. So I watched the video. I came to church Sunday morning, and after the service, um, my daughter's fiancé handed me a can and wanted me to look at the ingredients on the back of the can to see if they were okay. <laughs> and I'm reading the ingredients. It was really small print, and at the time, I had contacts in, and I needed reading glasses to be able to read these ingredients. There's no way I could have seen print that small. But I didn't even think anything of it. I had my glasses off, and I took the can, and I'm reading the ingredients and looking through it, and then it dawns on me, wait a minute, how can I read this? This makes no <laughs> sense. <laughs> my readers are not on, and I'm clearly looking at these ingredients fine. So I thought, well, I wonder if the Lord healed my eyes after because he built up my faith through the video and I wonder if he healed my farsightedness, I mean, my nearsightedness as well. So I couldn't wait. We went to lunch together as a church, and then I got home and got my contact case. And I sat in the living room, and I said, okay, Lord, this is it, because I'm taking these out. <laughs> and so I took out my contacts and looked around the room, and behold, I could see everything clearly. <laughs> So we got in the car, it was nighttime, and I drove into town, because we live 15 minutes out of town, drove into town, and I could drive, and I could see everything just fine. And so we decided to celebrate with Dairy Queen. 
And so <laughs> we pull into the drive through and I'm testifying to the 16-year-old to the girl at the counter saying, I, God still heals today. I don't know if you realize, but God still heals today because I can see now and I couldn't see before and I'm out here driving in the dark without my glasses on. And she's like, oh, okay, that's great. Praise God. <laughs> so God still heal, heals today and I'm a living testimony to that as well. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Go ahead, go ahead, Randy. No, no, I, no go ahead. You, no, um, I'm, we're not stopping with just that. I mean, this is, we're on a roll over here. The, had, the, folks online, these are real people. This is not staged. This is not made up. If you have faith to believe God for miracles, and you ask him, he's not going to say no. What he might ask you to do is go hook up with some other people of faith and get some, get some booster. Like it's like if you have a dead battery in your car and you know it ain't going to start. You need another car to get put jumper cables on there and give you a booster. That's why we go to church. We're all booster cables, batteries for each other. The Lord uses us to build up one another. And that's why we have these testimonies because every time we hear of something the Lord has done anybody does it build your faith like it does mine yeah. and when our faith jumps levels to get to the point where we just believe God to be God and do anything he wants to do and he says if you delight yourself in me I'll give you the desires of your heart how many people have some of the de desires in their heart? You delight yourself, delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the des desires of your heart. Randy, what do you got for us? Well, um, there's so many stones in our lives of the goodness of God. Uh, landmark times in our lives where God was so faithful. Um, and we've only been really involved in the signs and wonders for a little over a year, 13 months. And my Ebenezer stone was my baptism in the Holy Spirit. Um, it was the most not only remarkable experience, but the benefit and the abundant life that the scripture says we have when, when we take back what the uh, thief steals and, and tries to, to kill and destroy the abundant life, um, the word of God became alive in a different way for me when I understood how, how the Holy Spirit is not only a comforter and not only a, a guide, but a teacher and a revealer. And uh, that's something that's very important to me over my whole life. I, I wanted to to teach God's word, I wanted to pastor, I wanted to preach, uh, the opportunities never arose. Um, and after the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it was never more clear that I needed to pursue that uh, more. And as I learned to hear from God and I, and I actually talk less and listen more, I, uh, I have a had a problem talking too much my whole life but the lord gave me the pause button through my deliverance i'm also a, a a positive product of our deliverance ministry here and uh um have been able to um refine and allow god to continue to work and i hope in that he gives me many many more years of of this type of abundant joy and, 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 and 2020 was a horrible year for a lot of people, but it was life changing in such a positive way for me. And, and, um, there's just such, such joy that I can't even describe it. God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Yep. He's still doing miracles. Let me read you a couple of more. Got a few more testimonies. Um, this is interesting. So I'm 
We're still reading out of Nehemiah, chapter 9. Let me read you something in verse 20. Lord, you also gave your good spirit to instruct them, and you withheld not the manna from their mouth. You gave them water for their thirst. He gave his good spirit to instruct them. Somebody say, that's the Holy Spirit. I'm going to read verse 21. You ready for this? Now, how many people know that he let the children of Israel wander in the desert how many years? Forty years they wandered in the desert. Let me read you a testimony. Yea, forty years you did sustain them in the wilderness so that they lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wax old and their feet did not swell. That, that right there is a miracle. Imagine having clothes lasting that long. I love Levi's, Levi's jeans. Could they last a long time? And, you know, once they're at the point where they start getting little holes and things in there, that's just the perfect part. They're worked in just five, fit just right. In any case, but he allowed them that their, their clothes did not get old. Their feet didn't swell and they were walking a long ways 40 years is that a miracle um, I'm, uh, thank you Lord um, before I go on uh, there's somebody here you have problems with swollen feet who am I speaking to right now okay anybody else thank you because we just read that, that their feet did not swell, I'd like to tag on that. No, I don't know. Let me rephrase it. I'm feeling led to tag on that and actually minister in that area. I will start right here. Miss Shalene, which foot or is it both feet? Both feet? I'm going to need backup. Bobby, D. So you're tired of your feet swelling. And here it says he, he anointed them. Their feet didn't swell for 40 years. Micheline, I don't know how long your feet have been swelling, but from this day on, that swelling will cease. Who agrees with me that God can do this? Okay. I'm going to get right down there. You guys get back up. I'm going to just touch your feet right there. And I'm going to actually speak to her feet. Everybody learning, when you're learning how to pray for people, you don't pray the problem. Jesus never prayed the problem. You always pray the answer. And he said, speak to your mountains. So I'm going to speak to the mountain of swelling in your feet. I'm going to speak directly to your feet. We're speaking to the mountain. Here we go. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the word says, these signs shall follow them that believe. They will lay hands on the sick and the sick shall recover. 